If you have a Bible with you today, I want to invite you to find Matthew chapter 4. All right, and then once you've found Matthew chapter 4, you can kind of put your finger in that and jump over and find Mark 1. All right, and then put your finger there. And then, I know, you're only using two fingers so far. Third finger, jump over to Luke 4. Or it'll all be on the screen, okay? Um, But I I want us to kind of just read a a couple quick spots this morning here. Uh, I'm going to be doing our second and final week in our series that is called To and Through. To and Through. Last week, Pastor Aaron spoke about what it means uh, or what it looks like to give to the church. It's an idea or principle that we see in Scripture called tithing. A tithe, the word tithe, literally just means 10%. All right, and this was a law for God's people under the Old Covenant, and we are not part of that. Anyone after Jesus is referred to being under the New Covenant. It's a new agreement with God, okay? So why are we talking about something from the Old Covenant that doesn't apply to us? Uh, Something not being required and not applying is two different things. All right, something that is required of you uh, or not applying. I no longer live uh, under my parents' roof. All right, I moved out a little while ago, and, and technically I do not have to follow the rules that they gave me as a teenager. Okay, now I didn't really always do a great job of following those rules when I did live under their roof, but all that to say, I no longer live there. I I don't have to follow those rules, okay? Uh, But I have since kind of seen the principles that, that the rules that they had for me, what they were doing in my life and what they meant. And even though I don't have to follow those rules, those same principles I have transferred into my life today because I've just seen those are good ideas, They were meant to to just make me a better person and to live a better life. So even though I don't have to follow the rules that my parents gave me, a lot of those are still part of my life in some way or another. Just because they're no longer rules that I have to follow doesn't mean that they are dumb and useless and I should throw them away. I believe the same about many of the laws under the Old Covenant. I am not required to follow them. But God must have put them there for a reason. It might be worth looking at some of those And applying those same principles to my life today. Not in a legalistic way, but as like a a guide rail for me to try and live my life in the best way that I can. And and I believe that tithing is one of those principles that still carries a lot of wisdom, a lot of meaning, and a lot of benefits today. And I think you should consider it as well. If you miss that, uh, go back and take a listen. There's a great just illustration that Pastor Aaron did, and and I loved that. So, uh, but that's the giving to week. Okay, this week we are talking about what it means to give through our church. The way that finances are handled in many churches, uh, including the way that we used to do it, is that there are like, you know, all these different buckets that you can give to. All right, Uh, you might have a general fund bucket and a women's ministry bucket and a missions bucket and a men's ministry bucket and a youth bucket bucket, kids, building campaign, benevolence, outreach, like all sorts of different things. And you have all these categories that you can give to. What we have decided to do at our church is to try and simplify this idea. We went from having eight or ten buckets to having two buckets. All right? The two buckets are the general fund and what we call kingdom builders. And the idea is general fund is the money that is needed to keep this right here going. The ministry around here, the building, the staff, all right, if we want to continue doing what we are doing, that's general fund. And that includes, like, as we change things because we grow, it still is happening here inside of our building in that type of a way. The other bucket is called kingdom builders. Pastor Josiah, why is it called kingdom builders? Thank you for asking. Perfect. Uh, I'm so glad you asked. This is anything that we see as expanding the kingdom of God. Okay, some of that is local, some is overseas and around the globe, some of that is investing into the future generation, okay? Uh, And and so two buckets, two purposes. Tithe is what what funds the general fund and what happens around here, all right? Which, by the way, the the 10% of the general fund that comes in, you know, we talk about this idea of of tithing and maybe applying it to our life. We've applied it to our church as well. 10% of the money that comes in that is meant to keep things running here We actually take that, and that is what we support the the specific missionaries with around the world. We think if this is a great principle for us to live our personal lives with, it's probably a great principle for us to run the church with as well. So actually, as that grows, we pick up more and more missionaries. 
All right, so that's, that's that. Kingdom builders, the second bucket, not the 10%. That's what we're talking about today. All right, so where I want to start this, the idea I want to cover at the beginning uh, here, I think is massively important. Arguably one of the most important topics that we could cover where we're going to go at the beginning here. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Then I want to quickly explain how we see this playing out in our church. Talk about what it looked like over the past year and celebrate that, and then talk about what this means for us today, moving forward in 2023, all right, and what it looks like for you to be part of that. So, saddle up, partner. We got to get moving here, okay? So let's do this. Uh, Why don't we stand to our feet, if you're willing, if you're able. I'm going to read a couple of these passages, and then we will pray and get going here. So we are in Matthew chapter 4. This is going to be verse 23, all right? Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. Okay, jumping over to Mark 1. Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee, where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Luke 4. But Jesus replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. God, I pray that uh, as we run through this this morning, that, that things would just make sense and come alive in our minds and in our hearts. God, that we would um, we'd maybe look at these passages in a new way, with a new understanding that would um, just change the way that we live. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. All right, you can have a seat. If I were to ask you to sum up the teachings, the idea, the focuses of Jesus into one sentence, all right, if I went around and said, okay, give me one sentence that sums up uh, everything that Jesus talked about in his focus, uh, if we went around here, we'd probably have a lot of different sentences that would come out. Uh, You might hear things like, you know, love the Lord your God. Or maybe you'd hear, love your neighbor as yourself. Or do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, we try and kind of boil this down. Uh, Well, we just read three passages from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Okay, each one of those, uh, in in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those are called the Synoptic Gospels. That means that those three books are all going through Jesus' ministry in a very similar way. John... He's a little different. He's a little more artistic and goes a different approach. So the three synoptic gospels, we looked at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and basically we see something being summed up there for us. All three of these state why Jesus came, what his mission was, what his focus was, and it was shockingly simple. Okay, He came to announce the good news about the kingdom of God. That is why Jesus came. And the good news about it was it was here. It was arriving. It was near. It had begun. Uh, It would someday be completed. And you kind of hear all these different phrases. And this idea, the kingdom of God, or actually uh, also it's it's referred to as the kingdom of heaven. Jesus kind of uses those interchangeably. All right, is the main focus of Jesus' teachings. In the book of Matthew, uh, it is mentioned in some way over 50 times. All right, like this, this is what he talks about. So, this sounds really, really important, like we shouldn't miss it. But one problem with that, what is it? What is it? That, that's a simple thing to maybe look at and read and be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But if I were to ask you to explain that. Now when we hear the word kingdom... In English, we often use it to describe a place, all right? Like, hey, look, there's that kingdom over there, all right? Or United Kingdom, or, you know, like these different things. It's a, it's a place. It's, it's all that. And that's not how the Bible actually uses that same type of phrase. It's, that's why I actually, I like using the phrase kingdom of God, because I think when we read the kingdom of heaven, uh, and, and we have attached this idea of this distant place, kind of maybe to that word of heaven, um, and it, then we don't really understand what Jesus means by like the kingdom of heaven is here. What do you mean the kingdom of heaven's here? I thought the kingdom of heaven was 
over there. And so I, I usually like to just use the phrase kingdom of God because for me it makes more sense. Not the kingdom of heaven is bad, but it makes more sense. Uh, in the Bible, kingdom isn't really, uh, it's not a noun. It's not a place. You know, nouns, people, place, thing. Um, and it's not a noun. It's the word being translated here is often a, a verb or it's an, an action. All right, now that sounds weird. Usually a verb is something I can do. Like, um, Pastor Aaron, clap for me because I'm doing such a good job, you know, and she can do that, you know, or like run, like Pastor Aaron, run and get me uh, a snack because I'm still hungry from this morning, or like stab, like Pastor Aaron, please don't stab me because you're so annoyed with all the things I make you do around here. Okay, those are all, those are verbs. You can do those things. If I said, okay, Pastor Aaron, can you please kingdom for us? You'd be like, what? <laughs> All right, it just it doesn't really make sense. But, you know, kind of what makes more sense here, like in a way that would help us, is Jesus is announcing uh, the rule and reign of God that is starting to take place. See, that's, that's a verb. You can rule, you can reign, and, and that's something we understand a little bit better. All right, but he, he is announcing the good news about it, not just announcing it. He's not just saying, hey, it started. He's, there's this good news that's attached to it. So what is the good news? Uh, it's probably important. The Greek word here for good news is euangelion. All right, this, this word is also the word that we translate to gospel. And the word gospel has all sorts of Christian things attached to it. Uh, if I said, what is the gospel, or explain the gospel, usually you get something about God uh, making us, then we kind of made a bad choice, and, and God sent Jesus to take away all the bad, and so, so Jesus died and rose again, and now we can go to heaven. And that's what people would be like, what's the gospel? That's kind of usually the, the type of thing that would be fumbled through and said, this is the gospel. All right, well, we call the first four books of the New Testament gospels. Like, they, they are the good news, all of them, not just a couple lines or parts of that, not a small synopsis. Because of this, I think the, the term gospel, again, it can be difficult to use and to clearly explain what is happening because we have all these things that are attached. Again, I'm not saying the word gospel is bad. Some of you are like, oh, he's like crossing out really important things here. I'm not saying that. What I'm trying to do is get us to a spot where how do we understand this? So I want to use the words that will make sense to us. Now, euangelion was not a word that Jesus made up or the disciples made up. It was a word that was already used in the Greek language. All right, In, in the Greek and Roman world, like they used this word. So that word, it can't really mean something today that it didn't mean back then. Right? Like, so when we try and say the gospel is this, and we put all those things together, well, that's not what it meant to them. So I don't know if it can really mean that to us. And that word was most often used in relation to a, a, announcing a new king. All right? But it wasn't just about the king. It was about everything that came with it, all of the benefits of having that person as king. All right? So real quickly, this is something from first century Roman Empire. It's, it's, this word is actually very politically charged. It was basically used uh, most often in the Roman propaganda that they would disperse, all right? It was about the empire or kingdom and their victories and the spoils that came with it and, and could be enjoyed by anyone who was part of that kingdom, anyone who had pledged their allegiance to that kingdom or that king. So there's this famous inscription uh, called the Calendar Inscription of Priene, all right? You don't have to remember that, don't worry. And this is from 9 BC. So what's interesting here is we get to see this word, how it was used basically right in the same time that Jesus is there. We don't always get to do that with old words. Sometimes we're trying to understand what do they mean. So this is from 9 BC, all right? This shows us ex exactly what the word would have meant in those types of writings. So quick history. Julius Caesar. How many of you guys have heard that name before? Julius Caesar, all right? Roman dictator. He was assassinated in 44 BC. All right, now many people were trying to take over after him. And there was all these civil wars that happened for about two years uh, following that. And the funny thing is, for the Romans, when they'd fight civil wars, they didn't fight it in Rome. They'd go fight it in the other areas that they had taken over. Because why would you mess up your own land to go mess up someone else's? So they have civil wars going all over uh, of who is going to take over after Julius Caesar. Then Julius Caesar's great nephew, who also basically was his adopted son and heir, that's who Julius wanted to take over, Caesar Augustus, or Octavian is his name, uh, this is, he's the one that took over. 
And this is the name that you would recognize. This is the guy that says all of Rome must do a census. And what happens? Joseph and Mary travel from Nazareth to uh, Bethlehem, to the city of David, for that census. That's this guy. Okay, Caesar Augustus. This writing that I'm going to read from is announcing Caesar Augustus at the time that he kind of takes over. And this writing will show you why the way the authors of the New Testament the way that they talked about Jesus and how they spoke of Jesus' kingdom, why it was so controversial, all right, uh, and, and really just scandalous. So I want you to listen to this. This writing is about Caesar, but how easily could this writing be transferred over and mean something else, okay? So since providence, and providence is kind of like fate or God, since providence, which has ordered all things and is deeply interested in our life, has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, Look at God gave us this amazing ruler whom she filled with virtue that he might benefit humankind, sending him as a savior both for us and for our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things. And since he, Caesar, by his appearance, excelled even our anticipations, surpassing all previous benefactors and not even leaving to posterity any hope of surpassing what he has done, Okay, what that means here is we have this new guy coming in and he's so amazing. He's better than anyone before him and he is so good that no one after him can ever measure up to him. All right? And what they say here uh, is because of all this and since the birthday of the God Augustus, that's him, was the beginning of the good tidings. That's you and Gelion right there in this phrase. For the world that came by reason of him. So in this statement, they're basically saying, hey, because of this new king that has come in, everything is going to be great. This is going to be the best life you've ever lived because of everything that happens with him. Because you know what? He's better than anybody before him. He's better than anybody after him. And in fact, he's a god. And not only is he a god, but they thought Julius Caesar was a god. So he's a god and he is the son of God. Can you start to understand why what the early church was saying was incredibly scandalous. It is like taken right out of their book. Being like, okay, you thought that was Caesar? No, that's Jesus. But what we see as a description here is that it's not just announcing that Caesar is Caesar. It's announcing that his entire kingdom is going to be better than anything you could ever imagine. Everything that goes with it. That's what the good news is. That's the euangelion that's here. All right? And... Uh, so this is them changing the calendar, the Roman calendar, to match up with his birthday. That's why they had this announcement. All right? Um, so this sounds familiar. It should. All this to say, this good news, you and Galeon, it's not just announcing the king. It's everything around that. Uh, announcing, really, in this place, it, it's almost broken into two parts. Okay? First, it's like you are proclaiming. You're introducing this new way. And that's kind of like the vocal part. Like you go out and you say, Caesar Augustus is the new ruler. Jesus is king. You're announcing it with your words. This is what Jesus was doing, proclaiming the rule and reign, the kingship, the kingdom of God. God had made creation. He made us to rule and reign over it beside him. And we see this in Genesis chapter 1. And actually, we have that word, that rule and reign that we were doing. But we rejected his rule. We did it on our own. Jesus is announcing that God is coming again. And he is ruling for anyone who pledges their allegiance to him. And someday, his rule and reign will be made complete. And everybody will be ruled and reigned by God. This is what Jesus is announcing. And with the rule and reign of God in your life, with the kingdom being real in your life, there are things that come with it. Ways to live, responsibilities, benefits. But not just benefits for you, benefits for others. See, when you live in God's kingdom, when you live under his rule and reign, it doesn't just change your life, it should change the lives of the people around you. All right? And it isn't just telling people about it, it's showing them. It's actually implementing what this should look like. It looks, what it looks like for God to rule and reign. Now that's the good news of the kingdom. That's the euangelion. That's the gospel. Uh, that, that is the kingdom of God. And you can be part of it. 
And when you choose to be part of it, it isn't just a decision you make. You are pledging your allegiance to God and to his kingdom. And that means that there are actions that should accompany this. Can you start to see where maybe at times we've oversimplified what it means to be a Christian and to follow God? We say, well, you just say this little line and now you're a Christian. And now you can go to this distant kingdom of heaven. When the reality of what's happening here is, is he's saying this isn't about just repeating this and now you're a Christian and you're good to go. Just live your life however you want. This is pledging your allegiance to God. It's pledging your allegiance to his kingdom. And that you are actually going to be part of that. You are going to have actions that go with that. In the book of Matthew, we have this announcement that Jesus is making. You know, we read that, Matthew 4. Now, he gets up right after this verse that we read about him announcing the kingdom of God. And he starts something that is called the Sermon on the Mount. All right, this is him proclaiming. And what the Sermon on the Mount is, is this is Jesus explaining what it looks like to live under the rule and reign of God. As he goes through that, he says these lines where he's like, you've heard it said that this is the way, but I tell you, this is. And as he does that, it's always this heart thing. Like you had this little rule that you were following over here. Like you've heard it said, don't commit murder. I tell you, if you even hate someone in your heart, you have committed murder. And he's saying like, this is what it looks like under the kingdom of God. And really, as you read through it, you're like, how do I ever live up to that? You don't. In one way, you don't. If you think you can, just go read through Matthew 5, 6, and 7 today, and you'll realize very quickly, this is difficult. But here's the thing. It's what we are striving for. It's what we are trying to do in this time. And sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we get it wrong. But that's what we're trying to do. And someday, when when Jesus comes back and the rule and reign of God is implemented everywhere, then this is what it will look like. And so that's that's Matthew 6, 5, 6, and 7, is him going through the Sermon on the Mount. And he's proclaiming it. Now Matthew 8, as soon as he's done, he comes off of the hill, and as he's coming down, he is approached by a man with leprosy. And in that moment, he, he puts his hand out, he touches him, And he heals him. And he begins to go around and he confronts evil in different places. And he physically heals people. And what this is, this is implementing the kingdom of God. He proclaims it in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, this is what it looks like. I'm using my voice and telling you. But I'm not going to just stop there. I'm going to implement it. I'm going to show you what it looks like if we actually did this. And this is the rest of his ministry that he goes through. It is, it is the kingdom of God. That is what he's trying to get them to focus on. You'll see that phrase many, many times through scripture. So when we say that we are kingdom builders, when we say that that's our second bucket that we give to, I want you to feel a little bit of the weight of what that means. I wanted us to understand what kingdom is it that we're building? Why do we do this? Why why are we doing all these different things? Because this is our mission. Why do you think they're called missionaries? (laughs) I think sometimes we just use that phrase and we stop and think about what that means. I mean, that, that that is the church's mission. And we kind of use missionaries usually as a way of saying someone that's going overseas maybe to do it. But that is my mission. That is your mission. That is this organization's mission. That's what Jesus says. This this is the focus. So we are kingdom proclaimers, and we are going to be part of telling people about this kingdom. All right, that they can choose to be part of this kingdom. And when you make that choice, your whole world, your whole life will change. Many of our projects that we do as Kingdom Builder Projects focus on proclaiming this good news around the world to people who have never had the chance to hear that Jesus loves them. If people don't know about the good news, it isn't good news. Maybe over the last year or two, you've heard uh, about a new federal holiday that's called Juneteenth. All right, it is on June 19th, and it 
It's now a federal holiday as of a couple years ago. If you don't know the story behind it, you really should dig into it. All right, what it is is this. The Union in the Civil War had defeated the Confederate Army. All right, and on January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation, you've probably heard of that, took effect. This meant that slaves across the nation would be free. Now, Union soldiers marched onto plantations and read the proclamation announcing the freedom of any enslaved people. Here's the problem. When the Civil War was over, there were still areas where the Confederacy had control over that area, primarily in Texas. And in these areas, people couldn't march in and make the announcement. So if you were a slave in that area, no one told you that you were free. Why would they? Why would they want to lose all of the benefit that they have? So they kept going on living in slavery. And it wasn't until June 19th, 1865. Now remember, when did the Emancipation Proclamation happen? What year? It was January 1st, 1863. Two and a half years later, 2,000 Union troops marched into Galveston Bay, Texas and read the the proclamation, thereby making the 250,000 enslaved black people free. Quarter of a million people continued in slavery for two and a half years because they didn't hear the good news. It wasn't good news to them. They hadn't heard it. They were still living their life in that way. Now listen, the Emancipation Proclamation, like it, it was great news to all that heard it, but the areas where the Confederacy still had control, it wasn't. Romans 10 says this, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. And that phrase right there, good news, in Romans 10, is a form of the word euangelion. We have areas all over the world where the enemy still has control. Not just control, but the enemy is dominating and blocking. And there are people all over the world that they are still living in slavery to sin. Because they have not heard the good news that they can be set free. It doesn't matter that Jesus came and ended slavery to sin. That isn't good news to them because they haven't heard about it. Good news is only good news if it reaches them in time. Think of how many of those quarter of a million people died in slavery during that two and a half years. They should have been free, but they died in their slavery. And we have that same idea happening around our world right now. A massive part of our Kingdom Builders projects is the missionary support and sending these out, this is about announcing and proclaiming the good news to people who have never had the chance to hear it. So we proclaim it everywhere we can, but it doesn't stop at words. There needs to be action that goes with it. We also have to go out and not just say it, we have to be part of showing what it looks like when God is in charge. We need to feed the hungry, build schools for people that don't have them, rescue those that are being taken advantage of, bring hope to the hopeless, spend time with the marginalized. Because that's what it looks like in God's kingdom. That's what Jesus did while he was here. And that's what it means to be a kingdom builder. It is so much bigger than these four walls. And this is important. We need to be growing. We need to be reaching people around us, gathering together as believers. You know, everything that we do here as a church, it is important, but there is so much more than just these four walls. And that is why we give above and beyond to see God's kingdom grow. Because honestly, one of the best ways that we as Americans can do this is by empowering people and supporting people 
who God has called to go somewhere else. I don't think God is going to call every single one of us to leave and sell everything we have and leave our place here and move across the world, but he may call some of us. Are we ready for that? Are you ready for that? Have you asked that question of God? Or is the potential answer too intimidating? I mean, I get it. I get it. Like, there, there are times where I'm like, I don't really want to ask that question right now, God. I'm pretty happy where I am. And there was actually a season where Emily and I, we actually started working with our missions uh, organization in the Assembly of God because we felt that it was our time to, to take off and, and move. Um, and through us walking forward, then we just kind of, as we began to continue to follow God's leading, we felt that this wasn't the time. You know, asking that question doesn't always mean that you're, you're packing your bags and you're moving to somewhere that you don't want to move to. All right, now we kind of think that more than likely there will be a time where we're leaving and moving overseas and going somewhere. I don't really think it's necessarily a if as much as a when in our life because that has been our heart for as long as we can remember. So quickly here, I want to get through this and we'll, we'll wrap it up. All right. Last year, we shared what we felt the vision for our church was. All right. And you're going to hear a lot of different like fives that are in this. All right. And we initially even had five years as the timeline, but we were challenged by a fellow pastor to just cast this vision. And he said, let your church set the pace. Because he said, you know what? I actually think your church is going to do this in faster than five years. And at the time, we're like, no way, that is crazy. All right, so our seasonal vision, because, you know, like, uh, someday we believe that we will, we will reach this. And at that point, then we're asking God for a new vision. But, but this vision was to see our church give $500,000 to kingdom builders in a single year, in one year. We were not anywhere close to that when we started praying about this vision. And this isn't tithe, this is above and beyond. This is money that comes into the church and it leaves the church. This is through, not to, $500,000. We also felt that we wanted to see 50 people in our church be called into ministry. And this is kind of messy. What does that mean? What does that look like? We weren't really even sure. But we're like, you know, we, we know that that definitely means some people leaving here and going there. We also think that means some people may be disrupting their life, their job, and what they're doing, and God calling them into a new vocation, specifically to accomplish what he wants them to accomplish. And the last one was to see five locations of our church to reach and minister to central Minnesota. Because even though our heart is so focused on our globe, we still know that there are people that are hurting right here in central Minnesota, and we need to do something about that. So an update of what last year looked like, because we are currently in process on these, and I'm going to go backwards here, locations. We have started monthly services in Bruton, which would be our third of five locations. And actually, we are in talks with some people about a fourth location that we aren't really talking about yet. And we're praying about another one beyond that. Called to ministry, it's, it's hard to count and figure this out. It's a little bit messy. Uh, we knew it would be, but we, we think that we have about 16 people that are for sure in this category and moving forward in it. All right? We also have another 14 adults or so that have expressed that they think this might be me, and they are going through our MAP, Missionary Action Plan, or Ministry Action Plan, to figure out, is this me? Is this what I should be doing? We also have six to eight teenagers that have expressed this feeling and are praying about it. And we have at least three kids in our kids' church that, that have said this. So that's 16 people with another potential 25 people praying and considering. And kingdom builders. Last year we had a goal of giving 200,000 to kingdom builders. All right, you might say, well, I thought the goal was 500,000. Yes, but we absolutely were like, we can't get there in one year. So let's start setting some realistic goals. All right, so we had set this goal of 200,000. We had given about 120,000 away the year before. All right, so that is another 80%. That is a 66% growth. That's a lot, by the way, if you don't know that. 
Um, and and this, this past year, we put opportunities in front of the church, and we had some specific projects that we focused on, and we kind of launched this vision, and you guys gave over $298,000. That is something to celebrate, 100%. Because that's not, and you're not clapping at all for me in this moment. This, this, this is our church. All right, and we actually, there, there's a small chance that that could have eclipsed 300. But there's this weird thing where money comes in at the end of the year, and it was dated like December 29th, but it didn't hit the bank until January 3rd. And then the bank's like, no, this is 2023. We're like, no, that's 2022. And all those messy things. So we're just saying it's over 298,000 this last year. That is insane. This, again, above and beyond tithe and general fund. That's not just people dropping money in, in the offering plate. This is, this is money to kingdom builders. One of the things we did right at the end of the year, because so much extra had come in, is we had contacted a group um, that our missions team had worked with in Nepal. Because all of the projects that we were going to do this last year, we met all of those. And then we began to exceed them and give them more. And then we started to look for more things because we kind of like, we budgeted about 200000 to give away. And right at the end of the year, we have this, this extra money and our missions, one of our missions teams had just gone to Nepal and they were meeting in a church there, but their church was this tin shed that had no windows. All right. And it was like 10 by 10. I should have had the picture. Pastor Kyle's actually standing outside of it with a couple guys. And you'd be like, like, legitimately, it looks worse than the, the little building that we have on our property to keep our lawnmower in. And that was their church. And we're sitting there and we have this, this extra money. And can I tell you how cool it was? One of the coolest things was for us to contact them and say, hey, you said you wanted to build a church. How much is that church going to cost you? About 10 grand. I wish we could build a church for 10 grand. Um, about 10 grand. And we said, go for it. We're sending the money. And like, so basically on a Tuesday, on a staff morning, we're sitting there and we're like, we came out and like, we're talking to other pastors. We're like, hey, by the way, uh, we just built a church in Nepal. We're like, what? Like, it was this amazing thing. Like, when, when generosity comes in, like, it's amazing what can happen and how God's kingdom can move forward. All right, the speed of the kingdom of God is generosity. It's been so cool to see all of this happen. Ushers are going to come and they're going to pass something out here. And ushers, as soon as, you, as soon as you grab this, hopefully your head usher told you about this. If not, there's little booklets back there. As soon as you grab those, you can come forward and just start passing those out. All right. Um, this is our booklet of projects that we are doing this year. All right, this is what we have committed to in 2023. And I want you to look through this, uh, read what these projects are. You can, uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be one for everybody. You can take one uh, if you both want one or something, or, or one per family, it doesn't really matter. Um, now, on the cover of this is a phrase that says, for the glory of God. And we're going to talk about that in, in more depth over the next few weeks. We kind of just felt this phrase placed on our hearts in a way is almost even going to be a theme for our church for 2023, for the glory of God. We want to do everything for his glory. We want him to be glorified in everything that we do. All right, but this is a, a, a booklet that says all of the projects. All right. And in the booklet, there is also a, a pledge card that's in there. All right, and our goal for this next year, you know, we had said last year was 200000 Our goal for this next year is 350000 All right, now you might say that's not that much more than what we gave this last year. Right, but yeah, there's also this idea of low-hanging fruit, and we feel like last year we cast this vision and a bunch, bunch of people jumped in. We're not trying to have little faith here. I still think that's pretty massive. Uh, to say that. So ushers are going to be passing this out. Um, and in this, I, I want to just kind of challenge us to be ready. All right? And to be part of this. And, and so here's, here's what I want to challenge you to do. Okay? I have three little things that I want to challenge you to do today or over this next week. The first one is this. I want you to pray about what God would want you to do for kingdom builders this year. All right? Is there something that you could be part of here? 
Maybe you gave this last year to Kingdom Builders. Maybe you didn't. All right. I want you to stop and not listen to me and not feel guilty. I want you to stop and actually bring this to God. This is what we're supposed to do as believers, okay? You hear something from a person, you go back and you bring that to God. I want you to bring this to God and say, God, what is it that I could do this year? What is it that you're placing on my heart? The second thing is this. If you feel like God places something on your heart, then sit down and plan this into your budget in the best way that you can. Okay, last week, Pastor Aaron was talking about tithing. And for a lot of believers, our giving ends up being like a tip at a restaurant. It's like, well, okay, I had a 20 in my wallet and our meal cost $18 and change. So whatever's left is given as tip. And sometimes we kind of treat God that way. We're like, okay, God, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to do all these things. I'm I'm going to accomplish everything I need to. And God, whatever's left, like if there's anything left, which let's be honest, usually there isn't, we say, okay, God, I'll give that to you. Like Pastor Aaron's challenge last week was to actually plan this, do this first. And so I want to challenge you. What what could you do? If God has given you a number, if God's given you something, then, then Plan that into your budget. And then the last thing is this. Beyond that, keep your eyes open for opportunities throughout the year to be a further blessing. What does that mean? All right, last year, um, like, so Emily and I, we, we talked about this and we planned and we said, okay, this is what we want to do per month. But then beyond that, there were times throughout the year where certain projects came up and we were like, we want to give to that. That sounds awesome. And for us, that was like in above and beyond our money that was already kind of above and beyond. I'm not saying that to like toot my own horn in any way. I'm saying that you make a plan, but then you say, God, what could happen? And in those moments when extra money comes your way, instead of right away thinking about like selfish things, it was like, oh, wow, that's so awesome. We got this deal on something that we didn't expect to get. The extra money from that, we could give that away. That sounds awesome. And you start to live in this place of generosity. And so in that booklet, there's this little card, all right? And we would love for you to write that number down and put this in an offering bucket or a box at some point. You know, if, if you feel like you have that figured out today and you want to do it, go for it. Uh, but I think for most people, like, uh, you need to take time to pray about this. All right, now I want to make sure that everyone understands this here. All right, we are not checking to make sure that, like, everyone does this, all right? In no way are we doing that. And in no way are we going to come back and be like, hey, you said you were going to give this much per month. I haven't seen that. Where's that at? Like, none of, the, none of that is going to happen, okay? Like, so, okay, why are we writing this down? Because I think that for us, it matters sometimes to physically do something, to write something down. It makes it feel a little bit more real. How often have you said, okay, God, I'm going to do that as soon as I walk out of here, and you say it in your head, you never say it to anyone else, and you never do it. Right, But if you lean over to the person next to you and you say, man, I feel like God's telling me that oh, I, got, I got to go do this. Right, the, There's just a little bit more of a feeling of accountability. But again, there isn't even accountability because we aren't going to come back and check on that. Like that's, Don't worry about that at all. Okay, This is something that you are bringing to God and doing on your own. Turning something in just makes it feel more real. All right, So please don't feel pressure. Don't think that we are trying to force your hand in this. This is an opportunity. I think most people want to do something good with the money that they have. There's no end to the amount of places that you can give or where people are asking money. And so what we've done here is we have vetted organizations, looked at what they're doing, how they are using their money, and we want you to feel like, you know what, I trust the organizations that this church is giving to. That's the benefit of giving through the church. Because 100%, you could go on your own and you could give and you could be generous and you could find things. And some of you guys are probably doing that. Awesome. But what we have here is a list that we feel incredibly confident in what these organizations are doing. And it's a way for you to give. All right, so I want to I give us a moment right now. I'm, I'm just going to close us in prayer here, but even during this time, can you just begin to, to bring this to God and say, God, is there something you want me to do? All right, let's, let's not be afraid to ask that question because we're maybe intimidated by what the answer could be. All right, so let's, let's ask that question and, and I'm gonna pray and we're gonna finish our time here and you maybe wanna stick around in here. You wanna thumb through that book. 
Maybe you and, and someone in your family and you want to come up with something, that's fine too. Otherwise, if you got to get out of here, you got to get out of here. So let's just, let's, let's do this. Let's stand together and I'll close us in prayer and then we'll be done. Lord, I pray that we would take, take this mission that was yours Jesus, that you focused on, that you spoke about, that you, you proclaimed and you implemented and you did through your ministry here of seeing God's kingdom begin to rule and reign right here. God, and then you pass that on to your disciples and the early church and it has just continued. But Lord, somewhere along the way, I think so many of us have, have lost that focus. God, give us that focus again. Let it just burn deep inside of us that, that, Lord, we want to see your kingdom reign here, right now. God, not some distant thing that's down the road, and, but God, right now. Lord, I pray that you just begin to, to speak to each one of us. God, in a way that we are excited about this, not that we begrudgingly feel like this is something we have to do, but something that we truly can become excited about. God, and we just, we pray for every one of these organizations that we're partnering with. God, that your kingdom would be built. Jesus, we ask this in your name. Amen.